Very good evening to you. Thanks for choosing News Out Prime. Let's start off your sport with a breaking news. The Proteas are set to find a new mentor after the T20 Men's World Cup. Cricket South Africa announced on social media that the men's head coach, Mark Boucher, will leave his role after the conclusion of the ICC Men's T20 World Cup later this year in Australia. We'll have more details for you in bulletins to follow. Let's continue with the cricketing front where the Proteas have suffered their first Test Series defeat in over a year after they went down by nine wickets on day five of the third and final Test against England at the Oval. It was an easy morning for the hosts, so they only lost the wicket of Alex Lees. Well, the sneakiest of reviews. No one even saw Dean Algar review it, so maybe it was... With a 69 from Zach Crawley and Ollie Pope assisting, England reached the total in the first hour of the day. The result sees England unbeaten against the Proteas in four Red Bull series. As for the test captain, Dean Elgar, he finally tasted defeat in a series since the team's loss against Pakistan early in 2021. I always, I always bank on experience. Um, I know we don't have that at the test level. Um, so my next best thing is, who do we have with experience in first class cricket back home? Um, is that the right solution? We don't know yet. Um, we've still got a few months before our next series. And we've only got a handful of four-day games at home before we leave to Australia. Um, so yeah, um, that's, that's kind of the, the way that I'm going to word it going home. Um, it's a tough thing now because we guys have to learn the toughest formats uh, without not a lot of experience heads around them, which is which is always something we were aware of because of the, the amount of guys we had retire uh, back to back. But again, those are the cards we've dealt with, and we've we've got to find a way to 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 try and ease the blow for us. Well, joining us now to unpack the recently concluded test series is a former Proteus team bowler, David Zabrucha. A very good evening and welcome to Newsroom Africa. Uh, with that breaking news, is that the first casualty after what was a very heavy, heavy defeat uh, for South Africa against England? Yeah, thanks, Valent. I think uh, perhaps I think Mark's uh, uh, resignation or stepping down as, as head coach after the T20 World Cup has caught um, Everyone a little bit off guard, myself included, uh, only found out a few minutes ago. But I think it's, uh, it could be attributed to a number of factors. I mean, it just shows you the fine margins of sport. You know, Mark, you know, if they managed to get away with a drawn or a uh, series or even a win in the test series, you know, it would have been classified as perhaps a very successful tour of England. But, you know, it's obviously quite a meek capitulation in the third test. And uh, for going on, is perhaps a, a missed opportunity from the approach's point of view. But, you know, these, this day and age, to be coach across all three formats takes a tremendous toll on one's uh, family life, professional life, and um, just the stress of being involved in all three formats is, is, is quite, quite intense. So it'll be very interesting to see who steps up to the role post, uh, post the World Cup. Do you have anybody in mind? <laughs> I think it's too early to say. I think uh, obviously uh, there's been a lot of water under the bridge uh, since the, obviously the dramas of the uh, I suppose the, the SJN uh, inquiry, uh, Enoch Inquire, I suppose a year ago would have been a, a candidate, but he's now director of cricket. I'd imagine Enoch will be very intimately involved in trying to find a new successor. And it uh, depends very much what Enoch is looking for, uh, along with uh, the rest of the CSA board. Um, but you know, you know, off the top of my head, um, it's not that easy to come up with obvious candidates right now. Um, I'd imagine they'll they'll cast their net far and wide, internationally included. So, yeah, the, the Mark's given them plenty of uh, forewarning. So I'd imagine, uh, you know, well before they go off to Australia for the next, the next tour, they'll have a new, a new coach in place. I suppose in a couple of months or maybe even years when we actually look back at this, we'll think how remarkable it was that he didn't step down earlier, just considering the kinds of pressures that one has in trying to manage the three different formats with the team and then all of uh, the pressure that he's been under socially. Yes, I think the, the drama of the SJN committee certainly took its toll on Boucher. Um, I, yeah, he, <clears throat> having played a lot of cricket with him over the years and knowing him a little bit personally, he's certainly not one to back down. So I think it was in his nature to not um, 
step back and, and stand his ground in terms of uh, the accusations that were, that were leveled at him. But there's obviously something that's happened on this tour that he's come to the conclusion that perhaps the team has come to, he's, he's taken it as far as he can, you know. And I think particular, particularly on the, on the test cricket front, you know, I think the, uh, the batting was obviously a major concern. And we heard, we, mentioned, we heard Dean Algar talking a little bit about it. And perhaps Boucher feels that he's taken this team as far as he can. It has been rocked by a few early retirements in the Test cricket front in particular. Quinton de Kock uh, springs to mind immediately. Uh, but there's a, there comes a, there's a cycle in every team's life. And this one perhaps has come to an end. And, um, and I think, for whatever you may say, I think Mark has certainly improved the team's performance, particularly in Whitefield cricket. Um, of the, in the in the recent months and years, so I think he leads definitely leads the poachers in a better place than than he uh, than, than when he started. And I think you know we've got a, we certainly have a reasonably strong candidate to potentially win the T20 World Cup, which would be a great a great way to sign off. Let's speak a little bit about uh, the performance in England. We had this massive high at Lords, the home yeah. of cricket, and then it all came crashing down. So much expectation to bring it back in at the third test, which itself in, uh, began with a, a day completely uh, rained out, and then obviously uh, the day of mourning for Queen Elizabeth II. What went wrong, or what actually went right? Let's start there, and then we'll go to what went wrong. Yeah, I think a lot, a lot went right. I think uh, if you think back a couple of weeks ago, I mean, if you'd said at the end of the Lord's Test that South Africa had sort of had, had somehow contrived to lose the Test series in the next sort of four or five days of Test cricket, I wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have believed you. I mean, after the Lord's Test, we were flying high. The bowling attack uh, looked superb and it was largely superb throughout the series. But you know, the Achilles' heel was was the batting and. Um, uh, barring the first innings of the first test match at Lords when we got to 300 or, or over 300, thanks to sort of uh, some later later innings contributions from the likes of Marco Janssen and uh, Keshav Maharaj, you know the top order was very unpredictable and, and, and unreliable, and, and eventually it caught up with us. And you know you can't be bowled out for less than 200 in your first innings and expect to uh, to compete over over the course of a test match. So I think. That eventually caught up with us. So I think, as as well as as, as pleased as we can be with some of the standout performances of the bowling front and the bowling unit as a ge as a general, um, the batting clearly is a is a, is a sort of the elephant in the room that needs to be addressed. And uh, it's a complicated one because you know when you, you need to fall back on the first class or the local cricketing system, and there's outside of the guys that are in the squad at the moment, there's no one that sort of sticks their hand up, um, you know, in terms of banging the door door down. So. I think they've got the right personnel. It's about getting them to adjust to the demands of Test cricket, which clearly at the moment uh, the batters or the top six are certainly a long way from, from achieving. Yeah, it does feel like a, a, a conversation that we have far too often about our batters, and it feels like one that we've been unfortunately having for years when we speak about the Proteus Test team. Yes, I, I agree. I think um, one, one thing in their defence, I'd say... Very, very bowler-friendly conditions, particularly this late in the English summer. Um, you know, it's been a very long, hot, dry summer there. I think perhaps we expected the pitches to play a little bit easier, but you know, the ball did plenty. There was plenty on offer for the fast bowlers, and and the, the the bowlers on both sides exploited that. But our batters certainly were not up to the demands of of the questions that were asked them for, by the English attack. So, I think uh, there were some mitigating circumstances, uh, uh, funded distance injury. Um, obviously the conditions, but that said, you know, as you said, it's been a it's been a somewhat of a recurring theme over the last couple of years at the top six. But you know, we just don't unfortunately have the depth in the batting department that, that we did say four or five years ago in the heyday of of De Villiers and the likes of Amla in particular. Um, so it's about building, rebuilding a game from the ground up, which is difficult to do. As, as Former Proteas scene bowler David De Bruyne, thank you very much for chatting to us here on Newsroom Africa. We appreciate your time.